Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First off, I'd like to thank Campus Party for the honor of closing this event. How many of you came to Campus Party last year? Raise your hand. All right, so a lot of you are new faces. The iteration that this platform has gone through in the past 15 years is extremely important to the future of entrepreneurship, the future of innovation, and the future of all of you. Most of you looking in this audience are millennials. We're going to get into in this presentation why you sitting in this room is so valuable and why what you're about to learn is going to ensure your success going forward. Because where we are going as a world is very different than what you can even conceptualize now. Part of which is a book that I am co-authoring right now that will be launched and that we'll talk about at the end of the presentation. What I'm going to start with is a quote from Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell was an American mythologist, writer, and a lecturer. His background was in comparative mythology and comparative religion. And he talked a lot about following your bliss. Follow your bliss and the universe will open doors where there are only walls. If you follow your bliss, something else that Joseph said, you put yourself on a track that has been there all the while. And the thing is, your bliss is always waiting for you, waiting for you to capitalize on it. The question I hear a lot when I travel around the world to particularly the millennial generation is, Gary, I'm passionate about something, but I don't know how to do it. I know I'm passionate about X, I don't know how to do it. Or, I know what I want to do, but I'm not passionate about it. The reason what Joseph Campbell has to say is so important is because he founded what is called the hero's journey. The hero's journey is the basic pattern of how a hero becomes a hero. And at its core is the same across all cultures across the world. What my background is in is in comparative entrepreneurship. Now, in most respects, most people don't think that mythology and entrepreneurship have much to do with each other. And it's actually the complete opposite. Right? Comparative mythology is the study of, shared the of the study of different cultures, trying to identify shared themes and characteristics that are the same across all cultures. Comparative entrepreneurship follows that same type of theme, which is what I've done is traveled to more than 40 countries around the world, and what I've studied is entrepreneurs all over the world, identifying shared themes and characteristics regardless of what culture that entrepreneur is from and where they are throughout the world. As far as I can tell, I'm actually the only person in history to participate in architecting out comparative entrepreneurship and comparative innovation. There's other folks in the world who've done very long longitudinal studies as well. Joseph Campbell's one. Arnold Toynbee is another one. My background is in putting in 10,000 hours in meeting with thousands of entrepreneurs, hundreds of incubators, accelerators, dozens of politicians, prime ministers, presidents of countries all over the world. My business partner, Dan, his background is in having built and scaled three Inc. 500 companies in the United States of America, meaning those are three of the fastest growing companies in the country. And as Dan and I got to know each other years ago, we had a profound revelation as we compared the hero's journey with the entrepreneur's journey. What was interesting is they were actually one and the same. The profound revelation was that the entrepreneur, more than anybody else, in the world follows the same essence, the same pattern is the hero's journey. And the reason why that matters for all of you sitting in this audience right now is because there's a larger context, the larger context of why the hero's journey and the entrepreneur's journey are the same exact thing. So when you look at this, you can see based on those two quotes, they kind of play off of each other. Because if you follow your bliss, the universe opens up. If you stop at nothing to achieve everything, you can create whatever you want. You can create your reality. The interesting point about the millennial generation right now is they're really driven and they're really passionate, but they don't understand the intersection of what those two actually manifest as, how you build a company. So the presentation we're talking about today is precisely how to marry those two things together and build a company that is successful, that you're passionate about, and it brings value to the world. And the most important part of this slide and why these two matter is because they reveal why we are here on this earth. The reason we're all here on this earth, folks, 
is pretty simple. We're all on a hero's journey, and we're all entrepreneurs. We're going to now go to a video that's going to give a little bit more examples about this. What do Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo all have in common with the heroes of ancient myths? What if I told you they are all variants of the same hero? Do you believe that? Joseph Campbell did. He studied myths from all over the world and published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, retelling dozens of stories and explaining how each represents the monomyth or hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? Think of it as a cycle. The journey begins and ends in the hero's ordinary world, but the quest passes through an unfamiliar, special world. Along the way, there are some key events. Think about your favorite book or movie. Does it follow this pattern? Status quo, that's where we start. One o'clock, call to adventure. The hero receives a mysterious message, an invitation, a challenge. Two o'clock, assistance. The hero needs some help, probably from someone older, wiser. Three o'clock, departure. The hero crosses the threshold from his normal, safe home and enters the special world and adventure. We're not in Kansas anymore. Four o'clock, trials. Being a hero is hard work. Our hero solves a riddle, slays a monster, escapes from a trap. Five o'clock, approach. It's time to face the biggest ordeal. The hero's worst fear. Six o'clock, crisis. This is the hero's darkest hour. He faces death and possibly even dies, only to be reborn. Seven o'clock, treasure. As a result, the hero claims some treasure, special recognition, or power. Eight o'clock, result. This can vary between stories. Do the monsters bow down before the hero, or do they chase him as he flees from the special world? Nine o'clock, return. After all that adventure, the hero returns to his ordinary world. 10 o'clock, new life. This quest has changed the hero. He has outgrown his old life. 11 o'clock, resolution. All the tangled plot lines get straightened out. 12 o'clock, status quo but upgraded to a new level. Nothing is quite the same once you're a hero. Many popular books and movies follow this ancient formula pretty closely, but let's see how well The Hunger Games fits the hero's journey template. When does Katniss Everdeen hear a call to adventure that gets the story moving? When her sister's name is called from the lottery? How about assistance? Is anyone going to help her on her adventure? Hey Mitch, what about departure? Does she leave her ordinary world? She gets on a train to the capital. Okay, so you get the idea. What do you have in common with Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo? Well, you're human, just like them. The hero's journey myth exists in all human cultures and keeps getting updated because we humans reflect on our world through symbolic stories of our own lives. You leave your comfort zone, have an experience that transforms you, and then you recover and do it again. You don't literally slay dragons or fight Voldemort, but you face problems just as scary. Joseph Campbell said, in the cave you fear to enter lies the treasure you seek. What is the symbolic cave you fear to enter? Auditions for the school play? Baseball tryouts? Love? Watch for this formula in books, movies, and TV shows you come across. You will certainly see it again, but also be sensitive to it in your own life. Listen for your call to adventure. Accept the challenge. Conquer your fear and claim the treasure you seek. And then do it all over again. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you, in one respect or another, are on the hero's journey. How many of you does that story arc kind of fit your life so far? Somebody that you know, raise your hand. 
right? Just about everybody. One of the interesting things about the hero's journey and also about the entrepreneur's journey is not that just we all go through it, but that it's in every single culture in the world. There's heroes and there are entrepreneurs, right? By sitting here today, you are a hero. Somewhere in that 11-step process, you are. Today, we'll delve deeper into the hero's journey and the entrepreneur's journey in particular. And as what I've done in the world, having traveled, as I said, to more than 40 countries, what I've done is find the shared themes and threads that unite entrepreneurs, innovators, and creators, old and young, and on five continents. My goal at the end of the day is to make sure, through comparative innovation and entrepreneurship, that the fundamental keys to following your bliss, following your passion, being successful, are given to you. And that's what we're going to go through here today. For everything in our world, there's actually secrets. The funny part about the conventional wisdom of secrets is that we always think they need to be complex and very incomprehensible. And the fact of the matter is that most secrets are actually very simple. Quantum physics teaches us that most of the complexity that we see, even in this room around us right now, comes from very few organizing principles. It's usually two or three organizing principles. And so the fact of the matter is, and what's ironic about the hero's journey, is that most of the time, in the media, the things that you read, the shows that you watch, the people that you idolize, they never talk about the hero's journey. They certainly never talk about the entrepreneur's journey, because they've actually never studied comparative entrepreneurship. And the reason why that matters, folks, is because much of the advice that you've heard in your life about how to build and scale a company, I can tell you for a fact, is inaccurate. And in most respects, it's actually wholly irrelevant, which is pretty scary if you think about it, because at the end of the day, all you're trying to do is follow your bliss, right? But the challenge is that most of the advice you're listening to these days and that you've probably even heard here today and which I'm going to debunk in this presentation, most of that advice is actually what's going to kill you as an entrepreneur. Venture capitalists, false prophets, academics, they have all these nice presentations that say you should just scale fast, worry about profit later, and don't worry about the business model, just worry about profit. They have all these quick memes, right? Move fast and break shit. A couple other ones that I don't care to mention. But all those things are actually not what's in your best interest. They're in the best interest of everybody else but you. And so what this presentation about is making sure that you are at the center of your own business, your own bliss. Speed is irrelevant if you go in the wrong direction. The reason why I love this quote by Gandhi is because the core organizing principles of how to be successful as an entrepreneur, as an innovator and a creator are actually very simple. There's three elements, and those three elements, when they're combined, either produce cycles of abundance or cycles of destruction, creative or destruction. Most of you are sitting here today because I think you want to be creative. I don't think you want to destroy your lives, destroy your company, destroy the people that you care about. But there's three things in particular that have to mold together to make sure that you are successful. The first is culture. Culture can be intentionally manifested through seven key ingredients that we're going to go through. The second is process. The funny part about process is most of the things that you hear from investors, academics, and conventional wisdom says process comes first. When I used to live in Silicon Valley, what I thought was very interesting was that they thought technology, or excuse me, humanity was subservient to technology. Think about that for a minute. But what we've f come to find out is that at the core of any living system, whether it's an ocean, whether it's a rainforest, whether it's a human being, at the core of everything is creation. At the core of principled creation is culture. So why would you scale something before you have a culture that matters, that follows your bliss, that follows your principles, that follows who you are and what you believe? You don't. The point being is process is subservient to culture. The third step, and the third ingredient, is knowledge. When you put this puzzle together, what this says is CPK, culture, process, and knowledge. At the intersection is the secret. And that secret is how choice is manifest at this intersection. The choices you make in culture, process, and knowledge are what is going to make you successful or make you a failure. It's really actually that simple. 
And we're going to talk through exactly how you can be principled around culture so that you don't make the conventional wisdom mistakes. The best entrepreneurs do exactly this. They lie right in that intersection. The best human beings in the world, the best of humanity, lies in that intersection as well, folks. Everything we're about to go through, in particular, in culture, is based on neuroscience. So what you're about to learn about, particularly with culture, the C part, has nothing to do with conventional wisdom or the memes or what I think is my opinion. It's based on neuroscientific facts, which is how your brain actually works. I love this quote by Chuck Palahniuk. You know, the first step of controlling the world is to control your culture. I think that's a really interesting quote because it's true. At the base of any creative system is culture. So we're going to talk a little bit about culture right now. And we're going to put together a, a little framework. So without a foundation, you lose freedom. The foundation of culture, folks, is a choice. What we're about to go through, you can decide whether to follow or not. If you decide not to follow it, good luck. We didn't build out comparative innovation and comparative entrepreneurship just for the fun of it. What we're trying to do is show you in a principled way how to build a company that's going to be successful. So without a foundation, you lose freedom. You lose the ability to build the company that you want to build, to follow your bliss in the way that matters most to you. So what we're going to do is go through those seven key ingredients, step by step, and talk a little bit about the choices that you're going to need to make. The first nugget of gold is why. Because without why, you lose intrinsic motivation. Folks, at the end of the day, we're very simple human beings. We don't think we are, but we actually are. We move towards the things we desire, and we move away from the things that we fear. Decades ago, we learned about how human brains are actually hardwired. They're hardwired to talk about stories. The funny thing is the conventional wisdom, the reason why you raise money to build a company, is because you think you have to pay people. That's the first thing you think you have to do. In reality, human motivation theory has proven time and again that we are driven by intrinsic motivations. Your passion, your purpose, your cause, your belief. What my friend Simon Sinek talks about in his book, Start With Why. Right. Money actually works opposite of a motivator. So think about that for a second. If somebody comes to you and wants money, or you want to raise money because you want to hire people, money is not the reason to build a company. The story of why you're building the company is what matters. And every company I've ever built, the description of what we were looking for, the things that you would actually look for on a resume was about this big, three bullet points. We would have three paragraphs above why we were building what we were building, how we were trying to change the future of humanity for the better, not just for people in America, but for the entire world. The thing about when you tell why you do what you do, your passion, your purpose, your cause, your belief, people viscerally engage in a story. A story is not a commodity. What is a commodity is money. The second step in building the right culture is core operating principles, also known as COPS. We use COPS for short. So without core operating principles, you lose purpose. Right? Businesses are successful in two ways with purpose. You have a leader who's great at talking about the story of the company and where they came from. Or you have a leader who's a little bit more passive, kind of like the Wizard of Oz, stays behind a curtain. But what that leader does is empower everybody to be a creator, everybody to be a storyteller. They allow their employees to wrap passion and purpose around what they want to do. Those employees then don't wait for a job description. They become proactive creators. They become proactive problem solvers. And not because of money, because of heart, because of the story, because of purpose. And the power of core operating principles takes somebody who's a C player and makes them a B player. It takes a B player, makes them an A player. And it takes an A player, and those are the people who change the world. So that's the second step in architecting out a culture. Making sure the storyteller is at the epicenter of your business. The third is vision. If you don't have vision, folks, you don't have direction. And the reason why you don't have direction is because you need the magnet. 
And that might sound corny to you. Gary, why is a vision a magnet? Folks, it's neuroscientific reality. When you believe in a vision strong enough, your brain literally filters out tens of thousands of pieces of information every day and gets narrower and narrower towards the vision that you're trying to accomplish. That's the difference when you have a divine vision. Many of you sitting in the audience right now have probably had serendipity happen to you, where at some point you met somebody at a random place and you say, huh, isn't that kind of ironic? Or there's no coincidences, right? I don't believe in coincidences. That is the neuroscientific reality and the power of the magnet. When, of course, you have a vision. The thing about a vision and a mistake entrepreneurs make a lot of times when they're defining culture is that they make vision tangible. Vision needs to be an intangible goal. Okay? The reason it needs to be intangible is because it still needs to tie back to the story. It needs to tie back into your meta motivations, which is something that Abraham Maslow talked about many years ago in his research. The, the fact is, the stronger the vision, the stronger the magnet. The stronger the magnet, the more powerful you are as a leader and as a company. Next, we're going to talk about mission. Without mission, you don't have action. The difference between mission and vision is that mission must be tangible. Mission is the meat and potatoes. As a founder, this is what you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. And the reason why is because you need a rally and cry. The reason you need a rally and cry is because every day is a choice between principled action and following a bunny trail. Most entrepreneurs are not principled. Most entrepreneurs stick in bunny trails. They get stuck in this iterative development cycle and never actually produce something. And we're going to get into what that means more and more. But the fact of the matter is, in order to have a mission and a rallying cry that inspires your team and inspires you, it has to be part of your daily routine. Right? They say it takes 28 days to make a habit. Right? How many of you get up in the morning and visualize where you want your company to be in five years? Raise your hand. That's a start. Right? But what if you did that every hour? Right? What if you posted that in three places? Right? What if you posted that by your bed? What if you posted that where you brush your teeth? What if you posted that next to the door you go in and out of the most? I will guarantee you that will only accelerate your vision even more because it's a magnet. The next step is strategies. Without strategies, you don't have focus. This is actually my favorite principle. And the reason why is because it's all about the riverbanks. Right? If you think about a river, it needs riverbanks. Because if a river doesn't have riverbanks, it goes all over the place. Then you don't really have a river, do you? You have something that's completely unprincipled, that isn't weaving and, and moving towards something. What it's actually doing is crumbling. When you talk about strategy, the reason why Blockbuster Video, MySpace, Radio Shack, a lot of the big companies and name brands that uh, were popular in my generation, the reason they crumbled is because they didn't have a strategy. They didn't have a strategy that was permanent, and that's the key. Strategies are permanent. They're never meant to be changed. What all of those companies did was change their strategies over and over and over. It's one thing to iterate on your product over and over. It's one thing to iterate on your business model over and over. You do not iterate on your strategy over and over and over, unless you want to end up like Blockbuster Video. And the reason strategy is so important is because without strategy, you don't have a way to hold people accountable. You don't have a way for your fellow creators to understand where they're supposed to be going, when, where, and why at all times. Most importantly, without strategies, nobody can see the bigger picture. The next is tactics, right? Going back to how we normally think about process, we think process is just about driving efficiency and productivity. Folks, we just went through five other nuggets of gold in how you build a culture before we got to what is your daily bread, which is tactics. Tactics is what drives efficiency and productivity. Right? Tactics is your blueprint. The difference between a tactic and a strategy is that it can be thrown away at any time. It can be used one minute, thrown out the next. It can be used one day, thrown out the next. Unlike, obviously, a strategy. What a tactic does is it supports strategy. It energizes a mission. It works together with core operating principles 
and the storytellers to change the world. That's why the, the blueprint is so important, but the blueprint is not the most important. It's step six in this. And that's something to really keep in mind as you're building your companies. The next is without aligned incentives, you don't have a team. Right? What does aligned incentives actually look like? It's called shared value. What I find interesting about businesses these days all around the world, particularly those that raise money, is they have one agenda. Right? And that agenda has to do with return on investment. Right? Because that's really what you know, venture capitalists do. They make rich people richer. And that's okay, but the challenge is when you don't have aligned incentives with the people, you, your company, your investors, your stakeholders, and the world in general, if somebody loses, it becomes a zero-sum game. But when you have aligned incentives, when everybody is benefiting from what you're creating, your vision, what your bliss is, all of a sudden, the team that you have is dynamic. The team that you have is diverse. The team that you have is empowering. It's the difference between making things happen and watching things happen. Because when you have a team that has aligned incentives, they take the ball and hit it out of the park without you needing to be there. Right? The other part of it, and the most important part of the hero's journey and the entrepreneur's journey, is something we call ego. Right? There's a lot of ego in the startup world. There's a lot of ego in building companies. There's a lot of ego when you get in the press. There's a lot of ego when you raise money. There's a lot of ego when you exit. Folks, there's no room for ego when you want to reveal your art. Business is an art form. If you want to reveal your art, there's no room for your ego. When your team has aligned incentives, your ego is actually self-destructive to the mission, vision, and values that you hold so dear to yourself and the team that trusts you. The other reason aligned incentives are so important is because they're self-correcting and they're self-perpetuating. They're self-reinforcing cycles. Last but not least, Here's kind of what it looks like from an overview. These are the choices that you need to make, folks. Without all of these, you lose all of these. This is the choice you need to make. Are you going to create a story? Are you going to be a storyteller? Are you going to have a rallying cry? Are you going to have the courage to have riverbanks? Are you going to have the courage to overcome your ego? I can tell you most people don't. Hopefully you will. Next. Muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. The funny part about most of the things that happen these days is we always have these rules, we have laws, we have people that say, you know what, we need to do X because that's going to solve X. In reality, most complex systems, although they're simple, as we've already talked about, the best way to get through the chaos is to let the chaos play itself out. Our intellect, our fall, from being conscious, our fall from our bliss does not allow us to just let the muddy water clear by itself. So to give you an example about what it takes when it comes to culture, how to clear the muddy water, this is the statue of David. It's built by Michelangelo. The Pope went to Michelangelo once and he said, how did you create that? It's so beautiful. How did you create it? And so Michelangelo said, it's really simple, Pope. I just took away everything that wasn't David. Interesting. Well, so how did Michelangelo go about unraveling what David was? Well, first, David existed in his mind, right? He drew out some blueprints. He had some models of what David looked like. And then he started to re reveal the art, slowly but surely, right? Layer after layer, peeling back the proverbial onion, over and over and over again. Okay. So the Pope then asked, well, okay, I, I get that. How long did it take you to create David? Michelangelo said, three years. Folks, the reason why I tell you this story is because there's a natural process that you desire to follow in how to build and scale a company. Most of the conventional wisdom forces you not to follow that natural process that you wish you were following. Good design is an intentional process. Good design is about removing the unnecessary. That's what Michelangelo was great at. That's what you can do when you have the right processes. It's very much like the story 
that Malcolm Gladwell tells about David and Goliath. How many of you have heard the story of David and Goliath? Right. Great. So the reason Go David kept winning is because David followed David's rules. David continued to be an entrepreneur. He did what he knew best. Right? Instead of the same rules as Goliath. He went and did what he knew how to do instead of what Goliath in conventional wisdom knew how to do. Instead of armoring up, gearing up as a little farm boy with just a little stick, he knew he couldn't win that battle. What he knew he could do is take a slingshot and hit Goliath in the head with a pebble. And that's how he won. The same thing is true when it comes to conventional wisdom versus the real world. The conventional wisdom that most of us are taught is proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. They want you to document and then create. Folks, your brain doesn't work that way. Your brain works the complete opposite. In reality, your brain creates and then you document. Right? So what happens in conventional wisdom, ready, aim, fire. Document, then fire. Most of the things that you read follow that trajectory. The trajectory that you should be following is fire, aim, ready. You should create first, document next. After 10 years of research, my business partner Dan and I captured and modified the essence, the process of how to build and scale a company to reveal the art authentically. They all revolve in the seven P's of innovation. Everything in business falls under one of these seven P's. The reason why these seven P's matter is because it gives you as an entrepreneur, as a creator, as an innovator, an intentional focus. It eliminates the noise. Because most of the time, all you're hearing is a lot of noise. And if you're hearing a lot of noise, you're not able to be principled. Seven P's, we're going to go through them quick. Product, price, promotion, place, people, processes, profits. The thing is, that in and of itself is not what's going to make you successful. Nobody has put what we're going to talk about next together. Okay? There's five stages of business model development. We're going to go through these quick as well. The far right is what most people teach you. Okay? Nobody has married the seven Ps with these stages of business model development because nobody has ever studied comparative entrepreneurship from a wide perspective, while also going deep and building three and 500 companies. And the reason these stages matter when you map them with the seven Ps, folks, is because when you put these stages together, the magic secret is when you combine them. And what it does is it creates a force of nature as an entrepreneur. The reason I like this quote by Sun Tzu is because at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, what you struggle with, once again, is the white noise. What are you supposed to be doing at the exact time you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night? I can guarantee you, most of you have absolutely no idea. But in this quote, it's no more mere coincidence that this quote provides a secret to us, reveals a secret to us from 2,500 years ago. I'll give you an allegory. Imagine a battlefield. You have tons of guns, tons of tanks, tons of soldiers, Tons of death, destruction. What matters on a battlefield? There's so many chaotic things going on. The best leaders know no matter what, that at any given moment, there's only two or three things that they should be worried about. And in a battlefield, it's actually only one thing. Capturing the hill. Because this is how battles are won, once you capture the hill. So the greatest leaders, the greatest battlefield leaders, let everybody know, whether it's five soldiers, 50 soldiers, 50,000 or 500,000 soldiers. The number one objective is capturing the hill. The unfortunate part as an entrepreneur and as a leader is most of the time you're not communicating one decisive point to your stakeholders, particularly the people that you work with. And there's nothing closer to a battlefield than business. So, let's talk concretely about how you map the seven P's to the five stages of business model development. Folks, these are the methods by which you can achieve success. This is the natural way that entrepreneurs actually want to focus. What you see at each of these stages is a waiting and a timeline 
For instance, when you're first in product development stage, which is what Eric Reese and Steve Blank talk about in, in Lean, you focus on product and you focus on place. You focus on your product and you focus on your target market. And the reason you do that is because, once again, concentration of forces at a decisive point is what is going to help you to win the battle. The thing about this is business in general is just starting to understand this. Actually, nobody's ever seen this before, except for in one other presentation I gave in Brazil earlier this year. But the reason this matters is because business is just start starting to understand how to reveal the simplicity of what to focus on at any given time within the complexity of how to actually build a business. Business is just starting to play in this ar arena, but it's woefully incomplete. There's a reason why Clayton Christensen has said that venture capital is still in the trial and error phase. The reason venture capital and angel investment folks is still in the trial and error phase is because they don't have a concrete roadmap like this, which is built on 10 years of research and thousands of interviews. What this map does for you is it prevents the number one mistake entrepreneurs make, which is scaling too quickly. It also helps with a streamlined launch, better known as bootstrapping. The term I like to say instead of bootstrapping is, how do you build four companies for the same amount as one company? What this also does is build just-in-time management teams. So instead of building a team just so you can raise money, you hire a team at the right time for the right reasons based on what you're building. It can be very strategic. And the reason that matters is because this is also a visible expenditure dial. Where are you supposed to spend your resources? Where are you supposed to spend your time, your money, your communication strategy, whatever strategy you can imagine. This is the tangible way to understand how to do that. You know, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. Time and time again, when I travel around the world, a lot of folks think they understand how to build and scale companies. They think they understand culture. They think they understand process. They think they have a lot of knowledge. In reality, what they're doing most of the time is just passively submitting to the memes of somebody else who seems to know, think they know what they're talking about. The difference is, folks, what we believe and what is true is just an illusion for most of how to build a company to this point in your career. There's nothing more true about an illusion than in business. Because at the end of the day, it's not about raising money or making money. In my experience, having traveled to more than 40 countries, it's about doing well and doing good. That's what entrepreneurs truly care about. So this is your wake-up call, folks. We're going to talk now a little bit about some principles of the world's fastest growing companies. The world's fastest growing companies do not use business plans. They use a fax and flexible model. They're just like David. Right? They iterate time and time again. They realize a startup is not real. I cannot tell you how sick and tired I am of somebody based in ego being so proud that they have a startup. A startup is not a business. Most startups that raise money are not businesses. You know why? Because they don't have a business model that works. You have to go to market in order to learn how to go to market. What I love about what Eric Ries and Steve Blank have, have started to teach and has become much of the, the conventional way and now you build a company is the fact that you have to get out, of your, get out of your room and get out and talk to people. The only way you're going to understand how to go to market, the only way you're going to understand your target market and your product is by going to market. Designing a business model happens at the end of the process, not the start. Our ego wants you to be perfect. Our ego wants you to be perfect. You need to know all things at all times. Folks, once again, the process of how the world's most successful companies work is they unveil the art. They create, then they document. They don't document, then create. It's the complete opposite. Neurotically, we get so caught in our egos to where we want to be perfect up front, but that perfection is actually what kills your opportunity to be successful. Those self-governors that we talked about, the waiting and the timeline of how you go and build and scale a company based on those dials, make sure that you have self-governance. It's a principled way in which to build your business. And the reason why you need to be principled and why following the BMD matrix 
is important is because if you don't, you will make a deadly mistake. Nobody wants to obviously do that. A couple more principles real quick. Most of the world's most successful companies do not take a dime of investment. As our research has found, 84% of businesses never had a business plan. More than 60% never raised a dime of investment. And almost 100% of the world's most successful and fastest growing companies ended up with a business model that was different than the business model that they started with. Next, entrepreneurs live in a paradox. Perfection is actually what kills you in the early stages. You need to be just good enough, not perfect. It's about integrating your head and your heart once again. Your intellect really does get in your way a lot of times. That's why we spend so much time on culture. Because your head gets in the way of your heart. And your heart and your story is the way in which you're actually viscerally going to engage people and customers in particular. You know, the world's fastest growing companies, they don't work very well within venture capital fiefdoms. And the reason why is really simple. Folks, as it says up there, most of the world's most successful companies revealed their business model over time. What happens is when you raise money, you create a finite point that locks you into a business model, that you are forced to scale no matter what. The typical business iterates, comes up with a new business model between eight to 10 times before they find the successful model. Most entrepreneurs raise money way before they've iterated eight to 10 times on their business model. Not their product, their business model. And so what happens is you raise money in an inauthentic way and get locked into an inauthentic business model. You're then forced to create a fiefdom. You're forced to create a monopoly. Then all of a sudden, all the culture and the vision and the values and the bliss that you have and the reason why you do what you do gets thrown right out the door. All of a sudden, you get to be like one of my friends who owns a company that has about 500 employees. He's raised about 20 million in capital. And he tells me he hates his job. He used to love his job. But now he hates it because he raised money too early and the venture capitalists want their money back. And so now he's just basically a glorified HR person. He sits with lawyers all days and he deals with personnel HR issues instead of creating. All of you sitting in this room right now, just about all of you, you're not in the business of creating a business because you want to be in HR. You're in the business of creating a business because you want to follow your bliss. So make sure you're very principled about when you actually do if you decide to raise money. And the reason that all matters is because you don't want to really forget the sock puppet. Besides the pyramids, just about everything in life is temporary and transient, including our own lives. Right? Technology, by definition, is transient. Most of the time, we don't step back to think about what our legacy is. Right? And companies that don't define culture, process, and knowledge, CPK, they invariably fail because they're not principled. They don't have enough resources. And the only way you can have enough resources is to make sure that you're principled at all times and for all reasons. Let me give you some examples. In Web 1.0, you had the, the uh, pets.coms and things like that. 20 companies lost $3 billion. 1.5, you had the, the destruction of AOL and MySpace. 2.0, in the past 10 years, what you've seen all of a sudden is the fragmentation of true businesses into little apps and fragments of business models. Groupon for XYZ, Uber for XYZ. Right? The reason all of these things are happening is because the business models are inauthentic. They're raising money way too early. Now entrepreneurs are just going after the money. Money is the core organizing principle. The funny part of everything I've talked to you about culture, in particular, not once did I mention money. Not once did I mention money is a good thing. Right? The reason why is because money corrupts the natural organic way you build a company. And money is the organizing principle, and advertisement right now is the organizing principle of the internet, unfortunately. There's a good post by my friend Darren Herman. I recommend you check it out. It's called the oh shit moment. And the oh shit moment is the fact that the entire internet is based on inauthenticity right now. It didn't used to be that way, but now it is. It's based on advertising. But within three clicks and three iterations of what the internet looks like right now, there's, a company, there's many companies who are starting to ban ads all of a sudden, there's no way to monetize this inauthentic thing that the internet has become. What the internet is transitioning to, what the internet 3.0 is going to look like, folks, is an internet owned by the people. The internet will be owned by you. Not by corporations, not by Google, Facebook, Apple, 
All those fun little technology companies that get you addicted to them. You know why? Because what happens is when you raise money in an inauthentic way and you want to build a product, but the product has to be inauthentic because the internet is inauthentic, you know what your business becomes instead of following your bliss and creating a product that is great for humanity? You become a glorified data factory, also known as a glass cage, or you become a glorified PR firm. That's all your business model becomes, pretty much, when you raise money, instead of value. That's why it's important not to forget the sock puppet. The way forward, we're running out of time, so we've got to move pretty quickly here, folks. The way forward, it's really simple. You either save the entrepreneur or you don't. You save the entrepreneur to save the world, right? So how do you save the entrepreneur? Remember these circles, right? At the middle is where an entrepreneur is successful. The funny thing is, at the middle, based on comparative innovation, at the middle is exactly where innovation communities and humanity is successful too. The middle spot is actually the flow for both you individually and collectively. Comparative innovation and comparative entrepreneurship are self-reciprocating. And the reason why that matters is because when you miss culture or process or knowledge, there's a huge hole in the system. There's no symbiosis between these two. There's no alignment. By definition, if you don't follow CPK, you end up creating grave mistakes. What the opportunity we have is, is democratizing abundance, right? Creating an integrated society. Making sure that every individual and every community in and of itself is authentic. Creating value for everybody. Not just one little dot on the map that happens to be about 100 square miles wide in America in this thing called Silicon Valley, while everybody else in the world suffers. So why is this so important? I love what Martin Luther King said here. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every st step toward a goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. Tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. Folks, this is what an entrepreneur is. Being an entrepreneur is about being a humanitarian. It's about doing what is in the best interest of the world. Not your ego, not your investors, not anybody else besides you. You are not the goal of your own business. Because it's about much more than you. It's about much more than individuals. It's about building an integrated society. It's about an internet owned by the people. Instead of economics running the world, how about we have values run the world for once? Imagine an internet that was run on core organizing principles of trust, joy, bliss, equal opportunity, equality. Wouldn't that be nice? Until incentives change with the internet, until incentives change of how you build a company, nothing is going to change because everything follows the money right now. And it can't continue to be that way. The only way forward for humanity, because the platform for creation, which is the internet, the only way forward is for an internet to be owned by humanity. So what do we have to do? We have to stop at nothing to achieve everything, folks. That is what we have to do. Here's what I believe. Creators, more so than anybody else, when given equal access and opportunity, will solve all of the problems the world's face. How many of you know a guy named Peter Thiel, by the way? Raise your hand. Not too many of you. You know what's funny about this guy, Peter Thiel? He's got a book. Came out last year. It's got like 900 five-star reviews on Amazon. You think it's a great book, right? It's got 900 five-star reviews. You know what I love about his book and shows conventional wisdom and the arrogance of people in Silicon Valley right now? He says the only way to build a company is to build a monopoly. Folks, you know what happens, what happens when you build a monopoly? Is somebody else somewhere else in the chain, whether it's Nigeria, Australia, Zimbabwe, Chile, here, wherever. Somebody else on the other side of the chain is losing when you build a monopoly. That's what happens when you're inauthentic. You write a book that says build a monopoly instead of doing what's in the best interest of humanity. Instead of allowing people to stop at nothing to achieve everything, to follow their bliss, you decide to be arrogant and hoard billions of dollars. For what? What do you do with a billion dollars? I have no freaking idea, nor do I care to know, because money corrupts culture. Mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, that's what money does. That's why the internet is where it is. 
Second, economic development means much more than creating jobs. Folks, economic development is about your journey, individually and collectively. The politicians that you have right now do not understand you. When I travel around the world to more than 40 countries, most entrepreneurs, once again, get into ego. And they say, woe is me, my politician doesn't understand. What they do is they get up on stage and they just talk. But no value is ever created. Folks, it's your job to go to your politician and explain yourself to them, not the other way around. The reason why wars are averted, the reason why folks actually get along in this world better than ever before is because people just talk. Politicians are not in the business of creating. They're in the business of talking. Okay? It's your job to create. And it's also your job to educate them. Last but not least, the true wealth of man costs a lot more than money, more than any activity. Creation, innovation, and entrepreneurship are manifestations of humanity's true, unbridled nature. If you have time, folks, this presentation, go to weareallcreators.com. There, we are launching a book, 350 pages that will expound upon what you've learned here today. Right? It's all free. We're giving the book away free. We're building an app for the business development matrix. It's free. It's all free. And the reason why is because once you understand the future of the world being owned by humanity and not being a fiefdom, not being a monopoly, you want to do whatever you can do to save humanity. Right now, you sitting in this audience is a millennial. It is your job to be the hero, to be the entrepreneur, to save the world. Because within the next two years, the world is going to implode. We don't have time in this presentation to talk about why it's going to happen in the next two years. But the fact is, it's not a matter of when anymore. It's not a matter of why anymore. I already told you it's within the next two years, and it's all because of inauthenticity. It's just a matter now of how. So if you go to that site, sign up, we'll send you some cool stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We got about five minutes for questions. I guess I got to toss this somewhere. Oh, I'm going to go way back there. I got to try this. I have to try it. Oh! All right. Somebody didn't put that box together too well. Sorry about that. Is everybody okay? That'll wake you up. Jeez. Can't hear? Is there a microphone that we can give that gentleman, please? All right, let's go to the next question in the meantime. Yes, sir. Yes. Bueno, bueno. Do you have um, this presentation online or something that you can... Uh, At that website, the presentation will be available. Thanks you a lot. can download it, whatever you guys need. I'm here to help. You can always email me. I don't know why they took the email off. Uh, but you can always email me, Gary at GaryWhitehill.com. I'm here to help you guys. I respond to every single email. Because at one time, I was a no-name kid from a no-name place. Frankly, I just got lucky in what I built, guys. I didn't even really go into my history because this presentation is not about me. It's about you. Right, so I'm here to help. I know what it's like to not have access. I know what it's like to not have money. I know what it's like to come from a family where my parents never went to college. And I'm the first person to ever go to college. I know what it's like to have to work around the fiefdoms because all the really smart people think they should build fiefdoms. So you have to figure out a way around it. So I'm happy to help anyway. Is that working back there yet? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Um, my question is relating to uh, these new companies that are going to be created by the millennials. Do you see them being created more as uh, an open platform so where they're actually sharing a lot more than current companies are? Yeah, it's a great question. So his question was just to reiterate it, guys. Right, the future is going to be different than where it is now. Millennials are rising. The millennials are the one who's going to save humanity. Where is the world going? What is that company going to look like? The answer, sir, to your question is one of the things that we talk about in the book that's coming out. And the book's called I Am a Creator. And it's called Open Source Capitalism. And one of the principles in open source capitalism is called a public benefit company. 
So instead of exiting to a larger fiefdom, right? So most entrepreneurs right now want to exit to Google for $50 million, right? And all that does when you sell out to a bigger company is create more and more fiefdoms, more and more rigid business models, less equality for humanity, right? What you're going to start to see is business models that literally decentralize and sell themselves off to the public, meaning we should be able to buy whatever company. Instead of just somebody who's a high net worth individual who's at Goldman Sachs, right, is in their private wealth management who gets access to a deal. Instead, it's going to be decentralized back to the people. Because at the end of the day, why shouldn't all of us be deciding the authenticity of a company instead of some fiefdom that just cares about profit? Yes, sir. For you, which is the most powerful way to go out your comfort zone? I, I couldn't hear you. For you, which is the way to go out your comfort zone? I can't understand the last Last your words. comfort zone, wherever you are, like, do that powerful step to change your life and do all... What do I do to change my life? Well, what I do every day, I'll tell you my quick routine. I know we're running out of time. What I do in the morning, uh, when I go to bed at night every night, I have a bunch of prayers that I do. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is I have a book. Um, and it's, it's a book of sayings. Uh, it's 365 pages, 365 sayings from angels. All right, from your ascended masters, your angels, and things like that. I read one of those a day. It has a prayer in there. Also, another thing, right, when you talk about mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual, right, those are the, that's the foundation of you as a human being, right? Those are the rocks, right? Because if you're going to be authentic, you have to create a foundation. That foundation's built on rocks, right? So what I always carry around to remind myself that I'm always building a foundation, rocks. Because yeah? it's one thing for most of the people who you've all listened to this week, to get up on stage and tell you what to do. It's another thing to actually live it. Everything I tell you folks is how I live my life every single day. Middle of the day, I normally meditate too. You know, you, if you do the right meditations, you can get about eight hours of sleep in that one hour, the equivalent of. Um, and then at night, I usually write a little bit, talk about the day and, and, and where things are because when you write things down, they manifest it's the power of um, kind of neurology and things like that. I think we've got time for one more question. Yes, sir. You, in the striped shirt. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So his question is around raising money, right? So much of the conventional wisdom is about raising money and then building a product, or you need 100,000 users, and then magically the fiefdoms will bless you with a, with a tranche of funding, right? How nice of them that they'll magically, after you've done all the work, bless you with their funding from rich people. How nice they are. Um, the answer to your question, sir, is, is really twofold. First of all, at the root of any successful company, particularly the world's most successful companies, is culture. What's funny about the conventional wisdom of Silicon Valley, right, they start with process. They don't start with culture. By the definition, as I said in, in the presentation, by the definition, when you start with culture first, the right people come for the right reasons. It becomes a magnet, right? Most people could care less about getting paid. They want to get paid, sure. It would be great within six months for somebody to get a paycheck. But look, this is mostly the millennial generation. The, the amount of things you can do when your culture is aligned before you have to even think about money. When you focus on product and your target market first, you can iterate on that business model five or ten times, once again, before you even have to think about money because you have people who are involved for the right reasons, who are willing to take an equity stake, who are willing to take a risk first. Because you can always do the other way, and that's the difference, folks. You can always put process first. You can always raise money. You cannot always put culture first. You cannot always be authentic. That's the difference. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for everything. Thank you.